So, on behalf of the um, Office of Divine Worship, um, Sister Barbara, who's out there somewhere in cyberspace, um, I welcome you all to our first effort at video conferencing adult education throughout the diocese. As you can see by the sound check that we just did, we have people from all the way up north in Aptos at Resurrection Parish, uh, down here to us and every place in between, a total of eight locations. And by my count this afternoon with the latest RSVPs, well over 150 people from throughout the diocese who have gathered to listen to our beloved Bishop Ryan. <laughs> who we affectionately call a liturgy rock star. <laughs> so let's begin as we began our baptism, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for your countless blessings, for the blessing of life, for the blessing of breath, for the blessing of fellowship and friendship, and most of all, tonight, we thank you for the gift of the Eucharist that you have left for us. We thank you for our bishop and his effervescence, his energy, his goodness, his enthusiasm, and his intelligence that he shares with us tonight. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us all around the diocese, that as we come together to share and to listen, that we might grow in faith and grow in service to your people that those of us involved in liturgical ministry might be fed, that we might be able to more efficiently feed others. We pray your blessing upon this night and upon our bishop and upon all of those gathered here through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'd like to take a minute and um, just sort of go over the guidelines for tonight, and I'd also like to introduce the facilitators at each of the locations. Um, first of all, Bishop will do his presentation, um, and at the end of his presentation, at each of the video conferencing sites, we will break into small groups for discussion. Uh, we'll take about 20 or 25 minutes to do that, and that, that discussion at each of the locations will be facilitated by the facilitators in charge and by people that they, they ask to be involved in facilitating the small groups. After we've had our small group discussion, we'll come back together as a larger group, bring everybody back in through video conference, and um, have a chance to share throughout the diocese just briefly some of the thoughts and ideas that we've received from one another in our discussions. Um, in the end of it all, we will, uh, we will look forward to coming back for two more Tuesday nights to listen to the rest of what Bishop has to tell us. So let me take a minute and introduce people, first of all, um, I'm Deacon Rick Minton. I'm assigned as Deacon at Old Mission San Miguel. I'm a member of the Divine Worship Advisory Committee, and um, I'm facilitating tonight here at Nativity of Our Lady, and we'll try to organize as we feed back and forth through all of the other live sessions as well. As well. At St. Rose of Lima, Terry Burroughs, uh, who is with the um, Office of Catechetical Ministry and also a member of the Divine Worship Advisory Council. Terry, are you there? just waved. Okay, good. At Old Mission San Miguel, we have Tom McGuire facilitating. At St. Joseph's in Spreckles, we have Nick Bianchi, also a member of the Divine Worship uh, Advisory Committee. At the Pastoral Office in Monterey, we have Sister Sharon McMillan. Sister Sharon, there you are in the back. Welcome and thank you. Also a member of the Divine Worship Advisory Committee. At Sacred Heart Parish in Hollister from the Divine Worship Committee, Jean Marie Centeno. Jean Marie, can you wave to us? Thank you. And finally, at Resurrection in Aptos, Sister Barbara Long, the Director of the Office of Worship. Sister Barbara, are you there? <laughs> Very good. And then finally, sort of a unique thing that happened at the last minute, Father Mark Stetz has hooked up independently, separate from our regular diocesan video conferencing equipment. Father Mark is there in Cambria with his own equipment, also dialed in for this evening's presentation. So welcome to all of you. Enough about what we're going to do, let's do it. Uh, let me introduce to you someone that you all know and love as much as I do, um, our beloved retired Bishop Sylvester Ryan. I said to him when we were talking just yesterday, have you really retired? <laughs> he just came back from doing a retreat for the priests in the Diocese of San Jose. He just returned from Italy where he was the spiritual director on a retreat with the music group from our diocese who went and toured all over Europe, 
Um, I don't know when he takes a breath, let alone when he has a chance to actually act retired. But we're really glad that he doesn't because he is so gifted and so full of knowledge and so full of energy that I could listen to him speak forever. In fact, I have. <laughs> but he taught me in homiletics that that's never what you should do. So I'm going to shut up now and introduce our beloved Bishop Sylvester Ryan. Thank you very much, Rick. And uh, this is not only fascinating, it's very awesome. And it's a wonderful sign of the unity of the diocese. In fact, since we're talking about the Eucharist, one of the purposes of the Eucharist is to bring people together in the unity of the body of Christ. And here we have a contemporary, a way of doing that which uh, is just extraordinary to think about, but more important, I think, exciting uh, to consider the implications and the possibilities of all of that. This morning I offered Mass in uh, the parish where I celebrate Mass, and I, I did a votive Mass of the Blessed Sacrament and offered it up for all who are present this evening, either here or throughout the other sites, which I will also do in the next two Tuesdays, offer the Mass for your intentions. We are going to be talking about uh, the Eucharist, and we'll be doing so, of course, with one principle always in mind, which is the theme and the purpose and the goal of the fathers who wrote the document, the Constitution, on the Eucharist, Sacrosanctum Concilium, which was to bring about the full, active, and conscious participation of the faithful in the celebration of the Eucharist. The full, conscious, and active participation of the faithful in the Eucharist. That particular principle will be present during all three of these presentations. But I'd like to give you an image with which to begin. It's an image that I see as Eucharistic, although when I tell you the story, it may seem a bit removed from that at first sight. But it's, it's a wonderful image of the Eucharist in so many ways, and I will refer to it several times, not only this evening, but in our next two presentations. It happened a long way from here. It happened in Haiti. And it took place in the aftermath of the earthquake, which caused so much devastation to the people of Haiti. There was a young woman there who had volunteered to be of assistance to the CRS people there, the Catholic Relief Organization and Services, who were present there, by the way, before the earthquake took place. But she joined them there. So she was assisting in their attempts to be able to relieve some of the difficulties that were involved. She was on her way to where she was staying after working all day long, and she was approached by a boy, a young boy of maybe 12 years of age, who asked her if she had anything to eat that she could give to him. And her first reaction was, no, I don't have anything. And then she remembered she had a half of a chocolate bar. She took out the chocolate bar and gave it to him, feeling, of course, very inadequate that that's all she had to give him at that particular moment. He thanked her. She started to go on, and he walked away. But at some point, she turned back and watched him go over to a building. And at the building was a young girl, younger than the young boy, and then an even younger boy. So there were three of them. The young man who had asked if she had any food took the chocolate bar and broke it up into three pieces. One for himself, one for his sister, presumably, one for his little brother. The Eucharist is obviously the sharing of a meal. In this particular case, you have human beings 
sharing in the food. Because food, of course, is absolutely essential to our ability to be able to live and to live in some kind of a fashion where we are able to, to, to protect our full humanity. So, in a certain sense, it reminded me of the miracle of the multiplication of loaves and fishes in Mark's Gospel, chapter 7. Remember, of course, he's been preaching all day long. They have a large group of people there, which Mark says are 5,000 men. And suddenly it's uh, very, very real to them that they've got to do something about feeding these people. And Jesus asked, you know, <clears throat> what they have to do that. And they say, we don't have anything to do it, except there's a boy here with five loaves and two fishes. At that particular moment then, Jesus took the bread, blessed the bread, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples to share. That wasn't a Eucharist, but it was a kind of a future example of what the Eucharist was fundamentally to do, which was to bring human beings together to share a meal and a meal that was essential to their ability to live fully the Christian life. To take and bless and break and give. When we're talking about the Eucharist and as we go through these three particular meetings, it's very important to remember that the Eucharist is the prayer of the body of Christ. We call it the mystical body of Christ. But originally in scripture, the word body of Christ referred to the church, that we are the body of Christ. And that we engage in liturgy, in and through and with our Lord Jesus Christ, in an act of worship and thanksgiving to the Father by the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's a work of taking bread and wine, food and drink, and blessing them and sharing them with those who are there. And in another way, being prepared to share with that same kind of hospitality, those who are in need. But when you talk about the Eucharist, you're talking about a world of signs, signs, sacraments. And the first question that I want to present to you and, and reflect upon it is, what is the most important sign? Is it the altar? Or the vessels? Or the vestments? Or the, the, the decorations? The, the, you know, the environment? The most important sign are the human beings present. The assembly. People. People of flesh and blood. People who are the baptized, or if they're not yet baptized, hopefully will be baptized. They're the human beings. The most important element that we have to keep in mind is always that liturgy is about persons, body and soul and spirit persons. So it's not only about persons, it's about the senses of persons, the, the, the way in which we communicate, the way in which we take in information, the way in which we interact. This woman and these three children engaged in an interactivity of human beings, sharing something that was precious to them. And doing so, obviously, in such a way that as you take a look at it, it has a kind of a signification, a sacramental aspect to it. So whenever we're thinking about Eucharist, we're thinking about how do we go about doing Eucharist, we must always think, that the very first thing we're involved in is with human persons. Liturgy is about the persons who are present. Liturgy is about human beings who are present. The liturgy is about the needs of human beings who's, who are present. And so that's always got to be the primary thing. Now, liturgy, of course, is an action. It's a work. We define liturgy, of course, as the... As the, the the liturgy is the worship of the body of Christ. It's an activity. It's an activity. It's an experience, by the way. It's a revelation as well. But it's always, for our own particular purposes, a, a celebration 
of people worshiping together again in and through Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. So if we, as we take a look at all of these particular aspects of, uh, of liturgy, we must always keep that in mind. That's the prevailing, the prevailing sign, if you will. Christ is the first sign. Christ in his humanity is the first sacrament because he represents, of course, the sign of the presence of God in our midst. And as Jesus relates to his Father, humanly speaking, he presents to us, of course, the way in which we want to relate to the Father in the same way. So the Eucharist, then, is always a sacred banquet. The Eucharist is a sacred banquet of the people of God, gathered together, obviously, in worship and thanksgiving. People of flesh and blood. So keep that principle in mind. It's very critical as we go along to take a look at some of the aspects of the liturgy. The liturgy is kind of a, a marvelous, uh, you know, complex of, of dynamics that are interrelated, which are, which are continually taking place. And we can take a look at those in order to understand what they are for one reason only to understand how we can do them because to know what the liturgy is enables us to do the liturgy as is meant to be and in the process to fall in love with God. So the liturgy is called the church's sacred banquet. And, and as, as such, of course, then, we, we have to realize that it is a meal. So we're going to take a look now at some of the actions of the Eucharist, which are you know, very much the, the dynamics, the inner dynamics of the Eucharist. The Eucharist is always a prayerful action. The Eucharist is always prayer. It's worship and thanksgiving. It may be a very simple Mass out underneath a tree in Africa. It may be a parish Mass. It may be a great celebration of some huge occasion in the life of the Church. It may have no music, it may have the Vatican Choir or the Diocesan Choir. A big celebration. But it's always a prayerful celebration. It's always a prayer. We are gathered together to pray. It's a very important principle for us to keep in mind because sometimes it's forgotten. We, we kind of think it's something else, but it's always a prayer. This is what we have, of course, in Sacrosanctum Concilium. The liturgy is the full public worship performed by the mystical body of Christ, that is, by head and members. And from this it follows that every liturgical celebration because it's an action of the priest, who is Christ, and the body of the church is a sacred action surpassing all others. It's a public worship. It's not a private devotion. We have lots of private devotions in the church. It's a public worship where the church gathers together and in Christ and with Christ and through Christ again offers a praise, thanksgiving, and worship of the Father. So no matter what else we are doing in the celebration of liturgy, we always have to keep in mind it is meant to be a prayer. By the way, one of the ways in which we can come to better understanding of liturgy is to pay attention to three connecting activities in the liturgy, which are called prayers. The opening prayer, called the colic, the prayer over the gifts, and the post-communion prayer. The colic prayer connects us with the liturgy of the word. The prayer over the gifts connects us with the liturgy of the Eucharist. And the post-communion prayer connects us with life. We leave with that particular prayer. <clears throat> Three very important connections. And if we pay attention to those particular prayers, as you'll, I hope, hear in a moment, in a way that's very clear, the prayers themselves continually reveal to us a theology, an understanding, a loving appreciation of what is taking place in which we are involved. We first have to know that's probably an activity of the mind in order that we may be able to do and that what we are doing 
is an action of the whole body of Christ, in which all of us, of course, are the members along with the head. So, the Eucharist is always a prayer. Secondly, the Eucharist is a meal. It's a meal. In John 6, what does Jesus say? My body is indeed food, and my blood is indeed... My, the, my, excuse me. My body is indeed true food, and my blood is the drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. It's really food. It's the story of the two disciples on their way to Emmaus. We have been having Luke's gospel throughout this particular year, which has been wonderful. Luke is a gift beyond words to us because of the way in which he is able to, <laughs> able to give us Christ living out his own, in his own particular mission, his public life, and obviously his passion and resurrection. But in the 24th chapter of St. Luke, as you remember, the day of the resurrection, there are two disciples on their way to Emmaus. They come down from Jerusalem toward Emmaus. And they, of course, are devastated because the one they thought was going to be the Messiah has died. They've left the community, by the way, which is still in Jerusalem. They're on their way. Jesus appears, and they don't recognize him. And he asks why they're so sad. And they tell him what's happened. And then he goes, beginning, you know, as it were, with, with the, the Old Testament and going all the way through it to show how it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things. And it seems like he's moving on as they come to a point where they want to stop at an inn. They invite him to go in. They go in and sit down. And they break bread. And as they break bread, as he breaks the bread they recognize him and he disappears and they look at one another and say were our hearts not burning within us and they go back to the community in Jerusalem to tell the community what they saw and in that description they say we recognized him in the breaking of the bread recognized him in the meal recognized him in the sharing of what we come to call the Eucharist. So the Eucharist is always a meal. We have a table, and we have, you know, we have bread and we have wine, and we gather around the table. By the way, in, even in the old Latin, the expression for the people of God was circumstantibus, standing around the altar, right, to share in the Eucharist, sharing in the Eucharist as a meal. St. Augustine in the Confessions, chapter 10, says, when I come to you in communion, I don't become a part of you. You become a part of me. So that it's the meal in which we share in the person of Christ. So it's a sacred meal. But the Eucharist is also a sacrifice. It's certainly a meal. It's also a sacrifice. When we take a careful look at the words of Jesus that he gave to us, as we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in Paul, not in John, because the Eucharistic words for the Gospel of John come in the sixth chapter. And then the significance of those words also in John when he washes the feet of the disciples. So he, in this particular case, he is going to give us a sense of what it's about. This is my body which will be given up for you. This is the chalice of my blood, which will be poured out for you and the salvation of many. The very nature of the institutional words of Christ are giving you my body, which will be given up for you, referring to the crucifixion, and giving you the chalice, which will be poured out for you, looking again to the crucifixion. And this is the blood, of the, the blood that begins, brings about the forgiveness of our sins. So we always have to keep in mind we're balancing both of those. That they, are, they're, they're, they happen at the very same time. This is the bread, this is the, the, the wine, this is the body and blood of Christ, and this is the body and blood of Christ, which, in which Christ sacramentally renews the gift of love that he gave us in his own crucifixion. He doesn't die again, obviously, he's a risen Christ. But sacramentally, through signs, which are real, because it is really the body of Christ, it's really the blood of Christ, 
we renew the sacrifice of Christ. Now here is an example of that. In the votive mass, which I found this morning, there's a wonderful prayer here uh, that is, uh, is expressive of all of this. It's the post-communion prayer. O oh God, who has accomplished the work of human redemption through the paschal mystery of your only begotten Son, graciously grant that we who proclaim under sacramental signs the death and the resurrection of Christ may experience continued increase of your saving grace. That's the theology. That's the theology of the sacrificial meal. More importantly, in, in some way, it's out of the liturgy itself that we have this particular connection, taking us, of course, as I said, as the, as the final post-communion prayer into our life for the rest of the week. Paschal mystery, sacramental signs, the death and resurrection of Christ may experience a continued increase. The liturgy is an experience. The liturgy is a work, the liturgy is a prayer, the liturgy is an experiencing of Christ. So what we're doing in the celebration of liturgy, we experience the passion, death, and resurrection renewed by these sacramental signs. If we, if we sense that, if we grasp that, if we, if we come to appreciate that, that's what transforms our presence in the celebration of the liturgy into, obviously, an active and full and conscientious participation in the liturgy. The Eucharistic celebration is also a memorial. There's a famous Jewish scholar who said, there's one word that sums up the entirety of the Old Testament, and that is to remember. To remember. Because the understanding of that, the Hebrew understanding of that, was not simply to recall, like picking up your, let's say, the book that has all the photographs of your wedding, or the baptism, or the first communion. To remember is to re-experience. Re-experience. In the Passover that's celebrated even today, the master of the house will say, how is this night different from any other night? And one will reply, you know, and tell the story. But the story isn't told because it's history. The story is told because it's the way God is continually present to them. The same thing is true of the Eucharist. We remember, we remember not simply as recalling the past, although we remember the past because it makes possible the present, but because we experience now the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. We experience right in our celebration, in our celebration. And when the priest raises up, you know, the host and the chalice, he says, do this in memory of me. Jesus said those words. So we are reliving, re-experiencing here and now our redemption, our redemption. There is a prayer over the gifts the prayer over the gifts on Holy Thursday night. This is what it says. Grant, O Lord, we pray that we may participate worthily in these mysteries. For whenever the memorial of this sacrifice is celebrated, the work of our redemption is accomplished. Whenever the memorial of this sacrifice is celebrated, the work of our redemption is accomplished. Where are we redeemed? We redeemed at baptism, obviously, initially. But where is that renewed? Where is that, in a certain sense, uh, you know, re-experienced? Each time we are present at the Eucharist, wherever it is celebrated, the experience of our redemption takes place. Our redemption is accomplished. Where are we redeemed? We're redeemed in the celebration of the Eucharist. And that particular prayer, by the way, is very ancient in the life of the church. And in the general instruction, you know, on the sacred liturgy, it's the second paragraph of the document that tells us how to celebrate Mass. Because it's so important in our understanding of what happens when we gather for Eucharist. What happens when we come together to celebrate the Eucharist?
in which, in which, by the way, you are the participants, you know. As I, for example, and, and, and any of us priests, when we celebrate the Mass, we celebrate the Mass in, 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 in a, a union with yourselves, a communion with yourselves. We are together in the celebration of the Mass, each with their own particular roles, but all together in the body of Christ. Now, the Eucharist is a Thanksgiving meal. We give thanks. What does the word Eucharist mean? The Greek word means to give thanks, to give thanks. So it's another way of expressing that the Eucharist is a prayer. The Eucharist is a prayer of thanksgiving for everything that God has done for us and Christ has done for us in his passion, death, and resurrection. They speak words of thanksgiving. We give thanks you know, to take and to bless, to give thanks, to break and to share. And he used those words, as I mentioned to you, in the multiplication of all the loaves and fishes. So it's a thanksgiving, and we always have so much to be grateful for. We have so much to be grateful, and we are enabled to do that together as the people of God in our celebration of the Eucharist. And last of all, the Eucharist is a sacramental meal, a sacramental meal. Do I need to recall to all of you a definition or a description of sacraments? Sacraments are signs that do what they signify and signify what they do. They contain what they signify and they give what they do. Sacraments. And what are they? Water, oil, bread, wine, human symbols. Gestures, words, actions. What does water bring to mind? Thirst. Huh? Cleanliness, being cleansed. Refreshment, purification. Well, if that's what it is, then as a sacrament, that's what it does. That's what it does. All the sacraments are like that. Water brings to mind those things. And we can easily fold it up in the understanding of baptism. Why is it so important that we celebrate Holy Saturday night with the kind of very beautiful liturgy that's present there? Because it's the beginning of our sacramental life. Recalled for those who are already baptized and, in a certain sense, bestowed upon those who are coming into the church. And it's a beautiful celebration with all of the symbols which are there that particular night. But the most important symbol is water and the words. Water and the words. The same thing is true about consecrated bread and wine. Layers of meaning here. It brings out Meaning, communion, participation, reconciliation. This is this is what this is what the, the these things mean. Forgiveness, unity, mission, resurrection. Everything that we ever do with bread and wine, everything we do when we sit down to a meal, you know, is 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 present then when we come to celebrate the Eucharist. Except it's going to be transfigured, transfigured in such a way that it becomes the very body and blood of Christ. Here is the prayer for the 28th Sunday in Ordinary Time, which I'm sure you heard. Again, it's a post-communion prayer. Post-communion prayer and the prayer over the gifts and the opening prayer, we just let them often just go by. And yet, they're giving us, in a certain sense, the meaning of every step of the way. Now, in our present liturgy, sometimes their wording is not too poetic. It's not always easily understood. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it works. But here, we entreat you most humbly, O Lord, remember this, that as you feed us with the nourishment which comes from the body and blood of your Son, so you may make us sharers in the divine nature. Through this water, you know, which we place into the wine, we say the very same prayer. That through this water, you know, that we put in here, may we come to share in your divinity as you share in our in our humanity. The humanity of Christ brings us to sharing in the divinity. And we have a very bold statement here. Shares in the divine nature. But that's literally what grace is. Grace is to share in the life of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to share 
in that particular life. To become the sons and daughters of the Father, the brothers and sisters of Christ, and the living temples of the Holy Spirit. So when it comes for us to, to take a look at liturgy in terms of our particular ministries, you know, if you're having the, op the, 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 the opportunity or the responsibility of helping to craft a liturgy, uh, if you're trying to understand and make it clear to somebody else what goes on in liturgy, you really have to understand these dynamics that are operating all the time in liturgy. And an easy way to do that is to think about it as a meal and a sacrificial meal, and a thanksgiving meal, and certainly, of course, you know, of a meal of transformation of not only the bread and wine into the body of Christ, but ourselves. We need to know what liturgy is, so that when we do it, it can be for us a means of falling in love with Christ. It's, it's a journey into the deep relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a sign of the unity. It brings us together as the people of God. And so these are ways that are important for us to keep in mind because they become primary to what we're doing. Other things we're going to do, and we'll talk about later on, are certainly important. But if this basic foundation isn't there, then we miss, we miss the heart of the Eucharist. If we do that, we miss the heart of Christ. So now we're going to give you an opportunity, and Rick is going to explain how that's going to take place to reflect yourselves on the Eucharist. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you're all finished. Um, I apologize, we took a few minutes longer. We've got 75 people here in uh, San Luis Obispo at Nativity. It took us a little bit long to get through those. So we're, we're going to ask now the facilitators or someone who the facilitator designates to, uh, to come online and to share with us uh, what, how you can synopsize everything that happened in the discussions at your site. And I think I can hear somebody laughing. Your, somebody's microphone is on. We'll start with you, whoever that is. That's, that's you. That's you. That's you. That is you. <laughs> this is the, the laughing group in Aptos. I think that we had a kind of a couple of points came to the fore here. One of them was that for some of the folks here, this is not new information, but it was presented in such a wonderful way that it took uh -huh. on new life and vitality. <laughs> and for others, it was new information. Uh, one lady said it so beautifully. She said, I sort of knew these things in my heart, but Bishop Ryan put it into words. Oh. So that was yeah. Thank you, Sister Barbara. Anything else from your location? I think, did you do anybody? I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. If you'll go ahead and mute again, how about if we go now to um, Jean Marie in, uh, at Sacred Heart in Hollister? Yay! Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so um, yeah, I was going to echo what she just said because that's one of the things that. Um, a lot of us in our group, um, we already knew some of those things, but um, they were uh, they were just expressed in such a different way uh, that really brought it to life. And one of the main things I think, what did you say, sister? Um, was talking about the one of the most important parts of the, the liturgy are the people. And you know, we were talking about how do we make them understand that. That and that gets on the, the same point of the full active participation. You know, that they they their participation is important. They are there not as spectators. Like we say, you know, I always try and tell them that, you know, it's not a spectator sport. You guys are involved, you guys are part of the team, you need to be doing something. And we just, we want to be able to make that something that people understand that they're needed, they're necessary. This They are a part of that liturgy, not just viewing it. 
Anybody else? Steve? Anybody else? We, we were trying um, to figure out how, how, how can we be full participant and, um, and yet be devotional. Okay. Trying to figure Bishop, out how you to be take full. That? The question, hear, the question was how to be a, how to be an active participant and still be devotional. My first comment on that, and of course, obviously, there could be more things said about it, is a, to to participate in the liturgy is to be part of an Eucharistic devotion. The devotion is your participation. The participation is your devotion, but it's a public act of the whole church. So it's not meant to be a personal, individualized, separate devotion, but the devotion you bring to the Eucharist as part of the collective worship of the body of Christ. So that is your devotion in the Eucharist. Okay. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Okay. Um, Jean Marie, if you'll go ahead and mute again. How about St. Joseph's and Spreckles? We need to have you unmute. No, no, no. We can hear you now, loud okay. and clear. Okay, so uh, one of the things that, that we thought was, uh, well, in order to be full, fully active, full active conscious participation in the liturgy, one of the things was that uh, that it be more, a little bit more like life, a little bit less organized and a little bit more like life, so that so that you know we could be there instead of actually. Uh, it's about being there and not doing there. So that was one. That was one observation. The other one was. Um, uh, to be fully, full, active, co conscious participation uh, was to have uh, child care uh, that was, you know, available so that the, they could be there, or to have a, a liturgy that was more open and welcoming for childlike behavior of children and less <laughs> of a Less of a grind. So, and the other, the other thing, the other, uh, the other point was, um, uh, oh, participating, get, being actually active in uh, the the singing, the part, actually participating in the liturgy, uh, the the dancing things that we do, and what what was that? Uh, like the Easter vigil, you know, being a, an active participant in the in the liturgy. Yeah, there I just you go. Um, one editorial comment. I think I find it interesting that you're talking about children and childlike behavior, considering that your group is meeting in the cry room. And that is the truth, out. right? <laughs> Can I make a comment about uh, the? Um, the fact that you would like to see the liturgy more human. Then what, I'm, yes. what, I'm, what I'm getting from you is, you know, when you talk about that the, the primary sign uh, of all the signs in the, in the, in, in the celebration of the Eucharist are the human persons who are present there. Once we accept that as primary, then I think we're going to have to learn to be accommodating to the sometimes messiness of human beings gathered together, that it will always be something which is done like you were doing a liturgy in the Vatican. <laughs> Everything has its place. Anything else from the cry room? <laughs> we're good. Thank okay, you. I'll take that as a no. Um, if you'll go ahead and mute now, it's Breckles and uh, Father Mark Stetz in Cambria. Father Mark, do we still have you? Okay. Um, 
Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Can now we can. It? Now we can. Sorry about that delay. Um, we grappled with two things. The issue of sacrifice versus the more redemptive focus on resurrection and all. Looking at the violent aspect of sacrifice, that was a challenge. It's becoming more of a challenge, I think, in, a, in our culture. And as to the second question, we really saw great value for hospitality in our ways of just making people feel welcome at Eucharist as a community and in the action of receiving the sacrifice. Thank you very much. That's all. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's go to the pastoral office in Monterey, Sister Sharon. Anybody from a group want to share? Blues? Greens? Come on, here's our chance. We're waiting for us to speak. Tell you about the next conversations. I will. <coughs> okay, here we are. <laughs> the last, the second question had um, a lot of different conversation, but I think what really, um, what really I feel came out that was extraordinarily profound was that um, how we engage and actively participate in the mass is how we live our lives when we go forth from the mass. <laughs> So, for those of you that didn't hear that, Bishop mentioned he didn't hear that. That what indicates or is a good sign of our full conscious active participation is how we live our lives when we leave the mass. Ah, oh, yes. Thank you, Claudia. Anything else from um, the pastoral office? No. Okay. Thank you, Sister. Um, Old Mission San Miguel. I think a lot of what we talked about has come out already, and I would just ask anybody who, who uh, had something else for our discussion to add and share it. Was that dumb? Yeah. I think the big point that, that I heard more than once was to really listen. It's easy to be there and hear, but to listen actively is, is something that's, that's radically different so that you can understand, uh, so that the meaning really comes out. So actively listening to all the prayers of the Mass, as well as all the other singing and, and carrying it forth. Excellent. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Old Mission San Miguel. Terry at St. Rose. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I don't know how to get in with that. <laughs> First, they wanted to know why their deacon, Deacon Ed, was down there and not up here. <laughs> because we're lucky. I'm not noticing all the deacons are kind of circling down there. Anyway, um, that's, because, they said, that's because our bishop is here. Yes. <laughs> Um, they also said that it was, you know, they'd heard a lot of this, it was great kind of to re-hear what they know already, but one thing that kind of struck one group was that idea of memorial and that re-experiencing of their redemption. That was kind of a, a new idea or a new way to think of it. They also talked about ways of building community and how do they build community, how, how that can be done from the ministers at Mass to the people participating you know, conversation before or after Mass. There were a couple of um, questions. One maybe could be addressed at a future, um, one of our future meetings, which is kind of the historical uh, practice of the Eucharist, where we've come from, how it used to be celebrated to how we celebrate it now. And then there was a question about um, standing after communion and where the, if there's a directive for that, do we have our private devotion time or do we remain standing until everyone has received? I don't know if you want to respond to that now, Bishop. Or... You wouldn't mind if we do that next week because it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll not only, that's a hook to make sure everybody yeah. comes back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 
Yes. And then the last thing was just the hopes of talking more about the actual Eucharistic species, the body and blood of Christ. Um, transubstantiation was brought up, so just kind of a focus particularly on the Eucharistic species, and if you had more to say about that, Bishop. Okay, we'll, we'll take up the real presence next time along with, you know, your, your, your other question about uh, well, personal devotion within the Eucharist, it's, uh, as long as we understand it fully. But I'll take up both of those next time. Okay, thank you. You know, Terry, your question um, brings to mind an opportunity for people perhaps to submit questions and um, have Bishop take a look at them as he puts together, although knowing Bishop, they're already probably well put together and have been for weeks, <laughs> but, but perhaps adaptations. So let me give you all, if you don't already have it, my email address, and if you have any questions, you're welcome to send them to me, and um, I will disseminate them on to Bishop, compile them if there turns out to be a lot of them. Um, my email address is very simple. It's Deacon Rick Minton, that's M-I-N-T-O-N, at gmail.com. And if you'll send questions to me, I'll be glad to gather them and get them on to Bishop. And then, uh, anything else, Terry, from St. Rose? No, we're good. <laughs> okay, then we'll finish up with uh, comments here from Nativity. Jim, can you come up sure. and do those? Well, the one question that the folks here in San Luis Obispo had was why Deacon Jim's wife is in Paso Robles. <laughs> <laughs> we, we talked about with the first I, I told him we had to separate the power structure. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the first question, um, we were familiar with them, but uh, com comments were made first about Memorial, that um, because of it, the teaching like this that we're having tonight really helps us understand. It's, it's maybe a little more subtle, it's, but it's important to know, and the teaching helps enrich it. Um, also mentioned was, was the, the concept of sacrificial and the importance that people understand what it means, which this kind of teaching also helps. But to understand that, that, you know, that we're, we're remembering Christ present but not killing him all over again, such things. It, it's important for people to know the difference. We also talked about... Um, Someone had mentioned just the example of the changes from the Vatican to Mass to now, that just having it in vernacular that people can understand it so much better, and it really makes a rich experience. Um, and we kind of finished that up with just pointing out that the minister is responsible um, for leading us in the prayers of our Mass, need to really be prepared so that they're actually able to let people, um, to lead them into a full uh, and active and conscious participation. Um, in their uh, celebration. Okay. All right, so um, we're just about ready to wrap up. Before we do, I think it might be a good idea just to go around the diocese and um, see if anything has been brought to mind at the last minute. Any, any comments or suggestions? And Sister Barbara, um, I'd like you in particular to have a minute to, um, to have the floor and express your gratitude. I know you're very grateful for uh, the people from throughout the diocese who have expressed this interest and love for liturgy to come together tonight. Yeah. Indeed, that is so. It is so heartening to look look before me to see so many folks in the diocese. And right here at Aptos, we've, our numbers have swelled greatly from our estimate, at our first estimate. We want to thank you, thank Bishop, of course, and yourself so much for what you've done. And I'm just so anxious to see this happen more in the future. The enthusiasm that we feel here in Aptos, I think, is manifested in all of the other sites as well. So again, thank you, dear Bishop. Thank you, Deacon Rick, for all of this wonderful, wonderful presentation. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, Sister thank you. Barbara. That wasn't what I meant by thanking people. <laughs> Although I'll take it. You're welcome. Um, how about Hollister? Any last words from Hollister? One of the things they talked about was the now, that the, in, in expressing the communion, and Sister June brought it up, that, that God has no time, and the time yeah. is now. We're experiencing it now as we share the Mass together. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. 
Very good. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, Spreckles, any last comments from the cry room? <laughs> Should we all cry? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Should we all cry? Nothing with speckles, but thank you. Thank, thank you very much, you. Nick. <laughs> Any last comments from the pastoral office in Monterey? One beautiful sharing that I heard from one group was a reminder that the Mass is um, not just human beings alive now, but all the faithful departed who have gone before, all the saints and the martyrs who surround us. So we're part of this beautiful circle of life when we gather for Eucharist. Amen. And isn't that true even as we gather tonight? We join with all of the communion of saints in, in this opportunity to, to share our faith and to grow together as one. It's a, it's a beautiful image. Thank you, sister. Deacon Rick? Uh, Old Mission San Deacon Miguel. Rick, can we hold on one second, Deacon Rick? Spreckles, could you yeah. check and see if your lens cap is on the camera? Could you just take a second I'm, and see if that's on there? I think that might be the issue. We can continue on. Thank you. That was all. <laughs> okay. Old Mission. <laughs> I like it better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Old Mission San Miguel. Hello. <laughs> Any last words from Cambria, Father Mark? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and one last opportunity from St. Rose. Terry, you want to tell Jim I love you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, well, I'll go ahead and wrap up then, and then um, just to remind everyone that we will gather again next week at the same time at 7 o'clock in the same locations. Um, come back, bring a friend. And um, one of the things that um, might be helpful to some of you is to get a copy of Bishop's Pastoral, which he has recently rewritten. It's called The Eucharist, The Church's Sacred Banquet. Uh, it is available through the pastoral office, also available through the Office of Divine Worship. And facilitators at each of the sites, if you could find out how many people at your location might be interested in purchasing a copy, I believe it's $10.00. Um, and if you're interested, we can have copies for you at the uh, sites next week for you to pick up and purchase. And it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful book and a wonderful resource. Will they be autographed? And if you're in Nativity of San Luis Obispo, they'll be autographed. <laughs> but that's $20. <laughs> and that's $20. <laughs> So, Bishop, if you'd come up and uh, say the final prayer and give us your blessing, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Gracious and loving Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Eucharist. And that through our participation, we may deepen always our wonderful gift of sharing in your life. And more importantly, in terms of what happens when we leave, that we become the sharers of what we have received with those who need those precise gifts, and especially for those who are hungry, to break bread with them in some way that they may have not only the life that is human, but the life that is graced. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord in one another. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. See you next Tuesday and bring a friend.